All right, thank you very much for uh, coming uh, today. I'll tell you a bit more about COFAN at, this, at the end of this uh, lecture uh, when, we, when we'll get uh, to it. So the question I'm interested in is the following one, following one does uh, language shape the content of epistemology, right? It's a fairly obvious question. If, you know, most of us do um, epistemologies uh, in, in English, um, you know, some of us speak many languages and I guess that's the case for many of you. Um, but even if we speak many languages, there's still a, a language that we use for our work and I think for philosophizing. And in my case, that's, that's English. It's very clear that when I'm giving a talk in French, as you can hear, I'm a French speaker, it's just different, it's just harder. It's just not the way I do philosophy. And I'm sure that's true for some of you at all. And of course, French and English aren't that different languages, right? So if you look at a language that's very different, you might actually find a, a greater mismatch. Um, and I won't be able, unfortunately, to answer the question directly. I think that's a question that is very hard to answer. It's an empirical question in many ways. You're, you're entertaining a counterfactual, you know, what if I spoke, let's say, Mandarin as my only language, and what if I was philosophizing in Mandarin, would my uh, epistemi epistemology be different? It's a counterfactual, it's just very hard to know how to address that counterfactual in a way that's satisfying by controlling for other variables and everything. So, you know, I think, I think the question is just really hard to, uh, to nail down. But I think I want to present you with some evidence of a substantial and uh, largely undiscussed uh, linguistic variation in epistemic vocabulary. And why that does not really answer the question fully, I think I will, I will think that I will argue or I will state that it's actually suggestive that variation in, in language could actually result in, um, um, the type of variation that's philosophically significant. So let me get to that. The talk has uh, three parts. I'll first uh, start with uh, making an argument for the claim that lay judgments about uh, epistemological matters, about epistemic matters, are significant in epistemology, independently of your views about the topic of epistemology. And then I very quickly, and I might skip that if I'm a bit short for time, review some of the past evidence suggesting that Oh, it does appear that there's very little variation across languages and cultures and other groups. Now, if that's true, it might suggest that maybe we should not worry a whole lot about, about languages. You know, if it turns out that people all over the world have this, make the same epistemic judgments, then maybe language does not matter. And I, I'll just give you some of the evidence on, on, on the matter. But then I describe a new approach uh, that uh, I've been involved in uh, during the COVID period. It's, it's still ongoing work. And that suggests actually that using more sophisticated tools, we can reveal that there's a substantial amount of variation in the epistemic domain. And I'll, come to, I'll, I'll explain to, to you what, what that means when I get to that. And then I'll conclude. All right, so the first thing I want to be arguing, it's, it's uh, uh, the more philosophical part of this talk is that Independently of your uh, metaphilosophical views about the nature of epistemology and the goals of epistemology, let epistemic uh, judgments matter. And I think I won't have time to go into the great details about the many different ways one can conceive of the goals of epistemology, but I think it's roughly to start with a partition uh, uh, between two different families of views. Uh, on the one hand, you have some philosophers who think that epistemology is roughly a branch of conceptual analysis. And on the other hand, you have other philosophers who reject that view. They say that philosophy, epistemology is not about our epistemic concept, it's about epistemic properties themselves. So let's start with uh, the, the views that identify epistemology as a form or a branch of conceptual analysis. Now, um, I guess you know the joke about conceptual analysis. analysis. You take two conceptual analysts and you ask them what conceptual analysis is, and you get three views about what conceptual analysis is. So the point here is that you know every many people call this a conceptual analysis, but there's no agreement about what that is remotely. People have different practices, very diverse groups of, of activities. Um, as a nature of, uh, in any case, uh, I, I think we can bracket this question. Uh, let's suppose that epistemology is a study of epistemic concepts 
and I'll come back to the notion of concept in a minute. Or maybe the meaning of epistemic predicates, the meaning of to know. Or maybe if you don't want to put it in terms of meaning of concept, you might want to say it's the rules governing the use of epistemic predicates. Like if you're my neighbor on the 10th ten floor, like Bob Brandom or, or people around him, you might be more happy to, to, to use this terminology. Uh, um, the key point I want to be arguing is that for any of these views, um, uh, lay judgments are going to be mattering if when you do your, your epistemology. Why? You just need uh, one of two auxiliary assumptions. Uh, for some views about conceptual analysis, the use of concept is constitutive of, those co of the concepts themselves. If you're a holist about concept individuation, like for example, Ned Block in the 1980s, 1986, any use of a concept will be constitutive of the concept you, you have. If you, if you individuate concepts by means of their conceptual role, of their inferential role, some users of the concept will be constitutive. But even if you don't uh, focus on the role of users in constituting concept, pretty much everyone agrees that users are evidential, uh, well, sorry, that users provide evidence for the nature of concepts one has. Um, so that's a point that Alvin Goldman and Frank Jackson have made extensively in the 1990s. They've argued that independently of your views about the nature of concepts, the use of concepts tells you something about the identity of this concept. Right? Um, and, and I, I won't argue for that, but I'm happy to come back to that in the Q&A. Even if you're Jerry Fodo, and if you believe that concepts are atoms that are not constituted by their inferential connections, you're bound to say that um, uh, uh, lay judgments are evidence about the nature of the epistemic concept that you have. And I can flesh that out a bit more in the, in, in, in the Q&A if you're interested. So on that view, if you, if you think the goal uh, of epistemology is to study concepts, epistemic concepts, then lay judgments are either constitutive or at the very least evidential for the nature of concepts. So philosophers should care about them. Now, uh, of course, there's been a trend in recent years to reject that metaphysical view about the nature of epistemology. Some of the leading people who have rejected that view are uh, Hilary Condlis and Tim Williamson. Uh, they do that in very different ways. Uh, Condlis identify uh, knowledge with a natural kind. Uh, Williamson doesn't. Um, but independently of the differences, they agree that epistemology is not about the study of concept, but it's about the study of knowledge itself or other epistemic properties. But there too, uh, epistemic judgments are, are remain relevant for the goal of philosophy, as I think Williamson would be the first one to, 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 to agree. And uh, there are uh, uh, the main reason um, and I won't uh, dig too much, but I'm happy to come back to that issue in the Q&A. The main reason is that if we find that epistemic judgments are unreliable, right, then um, uh, it's going to be very hard to know how we're going to develop a theory of, of knowledge. Right? So uh, epistemic judgment will matter. Oh, sorry, let me, let, let, let me start again. Um, why are uh, epistemic judgments uh, relevant evidence on, on, on this view? The, uh, the reason is that uh, people like Williamson take it for granted that uh, the judgments are reliable uh, in at least many different contexts. And as a result, we can use uh, lay judgments in many different contexts to give us a handle on the nature, not of the concept of knowledge, but of knowledge itself. And indeed, it's a little bit hard to know how we would go about studying knowledge itself if we didn't help ourselves in at least some, concept, uh, some context of judgments about knowledge or other epistemic properties. And indeed, I think this is a very reasonable assumption. It's an assumption I agree with. In most contexts, I think our judgments about knowledge, John knows that, John does not know that, and so on and so forth, are totally reliable and can be used at least as a starting point to theorize about epistemic matters. So on that view too, lay judgments about knowledge are epistemically relevant. Not only are lay judgment uh, epistemically relevant, variation in lay judgment would also be uh, relevant. Um, so under most metaphysical views about the goals of epistemology, variation in lay epistemic judgment would matter. And again, we can go through the same exercise. We can look at epistemology as conceptual analysis. What would follow for epistemology as conceptual analysis if uh, judgments varied across cultures, uh, languages, and other, other groups? 
Well, that would be a, a puzzling situation. So it could be on the one hand that people have the same concept, but their judgments vary. Uh, but then that would be a, a fairly devastating situation for the conceptual analyst because it would deprive the conceptual analyst of his or her main tool to study concept. Or it could be that uh, concepts vary and that the, the, the variation in the use of epistemic concepts just reflect conceptual variation in uh, the uh, epistemic domain. Now that would be interesting, it would mean, let's say that uh, French people have a concept of knowledge and German, concept, uh, German people have a concept of knowledge prime, for example, related to knowledge, but not the same concept. Uh, but then uh, if that's the right situation in uh, the dialectical space, the question is, why should we care about one of these concepts rather than another? Why should we care about the concept of knowledge rather than the concept of knowledge, knowledge prime? And that puts great pressure on epistemologists to focus on one uh, parti particular way of partitioning the epistemic world instead of other ways of partitioning the same world. Now, let's suppose your views about uh, uh, epistemology are not, uh, uh, um, do not identify epistemology with a branch of conceptual analysis. There too, variation in epistemic judgments would be very significant. Why? Well, because it would raise questions about the reliability of our judgment. All right, as I mentioned earlier, people like Williamson make some assumptions about the reliability of epistemic judgment in at least some domain. But if it turns out that people have very uses epistemic concepts in very different uh, uh, ways um, that would raise question about uh, whether or not the epistemic judgments are reliable. And you have a form of disagreement. And if you assume that people are um, uh, roughly uh, on an epistemic par, uh, they're experts, as uh, equal, their degree of expertise are similar. Then, it, then I think the right conclusion is to conclude that those people, uh, that the use of epistemic concept is unreliable. And that deprive again the philosopher from his uh, most, common, most uh, used source, of, not maybe the only one, but from his most used source of evidence to theorize about epistemic properties. So variation would matter independently of your metaphysical view about the nature of of uh, epistemology. Now, I've, got, I've been going very fast here. I've been sketching the argument about why variation matters independently of your views about what philosophy is about. It's related to an argument I've developed in chapter four of my book, Philosophy Within Its Proper, uh, within its proper Bounds, uh, on Shining of Prejudices. Uh, if you're interested uh, in this uh, uh, dilemma that I've quickly sketched out, you can, you can have a, a greater look at this argument. Now, let's, variation would matter if there were variation. Where could variation come from? Well, it could come from, from many places. It could come from cultures, for example. But another place it could come from is from uh, languages. And as you know, there are 7,000, or as you might know, there's currently um, about 7,000 languages in the world. Um, if you look historically, there probably was much, 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 much more. Uh, out of the 7,000 languages, half of them are endangered. So half of them are um, uh, might actually disappear within a century, and sometimes much, much earlier than, than that. And uh, this language, while these languages divide into broad families, right? So French and, 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 and Spanish are uh, Indo-European languages, uh, so they're related to one another. Uh, some of these languages belong to very different families that have diverged centuries and millenaries and millenaries millenaries ago. And variation affect not only syntax, but also, or it also affect our morphology uh, and, 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 and uh, phonology. It also affects uh, semantics. Um, so there's a reason to, to think here that uh, this uh, variation uh, in languages might actually have an influence in the type of uh, uh, epistemic concepts and uh, the type of epistemic distinctions that uh, less speakers draw in the epistemic domain. I'll come back to that in the third section of this lecture. But of course, an empirical question is not something you can decide from the armchair. You need some empirical evidence. So the question is, do epistemic judgments vary across languages? Or rather, can we expect the judgments of English speakers to be shared as a first approximation all over the world? What's the, what does the evidence say? All right. So that was a, uh, the, the philosophical setting to motivate the significance of variation for philosophical views in epistemology, for the use of, of uh, lay judgments in epistemology, and um, as a suggestion that language might matter. But of course, an empirical question, as I said, 
Uh, what does the, the evidence say? As you probably know, as, uh, as many of you might know, uh, experimental philosophy was, among others, born uh, from this uh, paper by Weinberg, uh, Nichols, and Stitch, Normativity and Epistemic Intuition, that made a splash in 2001 when it was published now more than 20 years ago, that argued that uh, judgments elicited by some of the most famous epistemic uh, thought experiments, including the Getty case, um, uh, vary across uh, cultures. I mean, they put it in terms of cultures, but also uh, varies across cultures. So, for example, East Asian and Westerners were supposed to have a uh, very different uh, intuition. Now, as you probably also know, this finding does not replicate, so we need not worry too much about, um, about this early uh, paper. But this early paper was actually the source of a very uh, lively uh, and not always friendly, I should say, uh, uh, metaphilosophical discussion about the role of a variation across groups, either cultural group or linguistic uh, groups, particularly among Jennifer Nagel and uh, Steve um, and, and Steve Stitch. This um, um, debate has actually moved a little bit away from the debate between, uh, let's say, critics, even friendly critics of experimental philosophy and experimental philosophers. It's moved within experimental philosophy. Um, so there's a disagreement within experimental philosophers here between people like uh, Josh Nob, um, uh, who have argued uh, repeatedly, but particularly in, the, in this paper, Knowledge Before Belief, that there is a universal prelinguistic concept of knowledge that is shared by all human beings, emerge very early on in life, and even is even shared by uh, apes. Now, if that's true, Clearly, language doesn't matter, right? Uh, you know, if uh, chimpanzees already have the concept of knowledge and share it with us, uh, we can just stick with our good uh, uh, linguistic intuition in English and be happy with reading uh, English books and forget about um, uh, uh, being careful in the role of language in um, uh, the construction of our epistemic thinking, of our thinking in, in epistemology. However, uh, uh, I've argued with some of my colleagues in response to, uh, in a short response to uh, uh, Philip and colleagues' paper, that uh, they are going way too fast. Um, 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 and one of the reason is that they're going too fast is that uh, all of their data, pretty much, uh, uh, all of their ling linguistic data, excluding the monkey data and the uh, children data, all of their linguistic data come from one language. Um, uh, and you know, I think it's 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 really, and of course, you you know what this language is, right? It's English. Uh, so uh, I, I think it's going very very fast to to argue that there's a great match between uh, the concept of knowledge used by human beings and the concept of what they identify as a concept of knowledge used by primates. You know, it might actually be that human beings use many different languages, and that uh, uh, they all differ in some respect or others from what. The, con the let's say concept of knowledge that apes happen to be uh, to be using in their everyday practices. Uh, so we've responded uh, to to, the, to that paper. On the other hand, I think it's fair to say that if you look at the last ten years of uh, experimental epistemology, while there's been some evidence of variation, much of the evidence has converged in finding a and what was, to my surprise, a surprising amount of convergence. I mean, I have to uh, I have to say I was surprised by and I'm still surprised by the fact that in some of the work I've been doing in quite a diverse range of, of countries and cultures and languages, there's a surprising amount of, 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 of homogeneity. So that's the first paper we published in 2018. So it was a very simple paper. We gave people some Getty cases, contrasted with clear, case, clear cases of knowledge, clear cases of lack of knowledge. And what you can see, uh, we did that in the USA, Brazil, Japan, and India in uh, uh, Bengali. And uh, what you can see is that pretty much the, case, the Getty cases are treated as cases of false belief. Not exactly, you know, there's a little bit of variation, but they're very different from the, from the cases of, of clear, clear knowledge, right? It's a very different, uh, very different case. There's a, li there's a little bit, of, I, I don't know, I, so you don't see my, my, uh, my, uh, my um, um, mouse pointer, but if you, there's some interesting variations that I will flag out and we can come back. If you look at the, at the India data, the Bengali data, we, we had two ways of asking the question, no, no not no, and, and contrasting, uh, uh, it seems that she knows, but she doesn't really know, and she knows. 
Right. So the second version was, in a sense, a, str a, a stronger test because so the choice was she seems to know, but she doesn't really know, and she doesn't know. All right. So it's kind of a stronger test. But if you use if you just contrast knowing versus not knowing in in Bengali, actually people don't have the, the don't have the Getty intuition with one way of framing the question. We can come back to that in a minute. It's relevant to the third part of this lecture. Uh, so maybe keep that in mind for the for the Q and A. And uh, in the following paper, we've, we've replicated that, that study uh, with a much larger range of, of, of countries. So again, um, uh, if looking at the second way, the stricter way of asking the question Getty case, what you can see is pretty much all over the world, it's possible to elicit the Getty intuition. Uh, it's not simply the Getty intuition that happens to seem to be uh, invariant across both cultures and languages. It's also judgments about the whole of stakes, so that's one of my favorite paper. Uh, if you compare uh, the uh, low stakes and high stake cases, bank cases, uh, in a bunch of languages, what you see is that in no culture do you find any meaningful difference. Just people don't care about the difference between the low, the low, the low stake bank case and the high stake bank case. Again, what we have here is uh, a universal negative result, one might say. This stakes variable just doesn't matter. Uh, across languages and, and culture. And that fits with a little bit of work in linguistics by uh, V.S. Bika, uh, who is a very important linguist in uh, ANU in Australia, at ANU in Australia, uh, where uh, V.S. Bika's whole research program is to identify what she called semantic crime, semantic primitives. It's a very Leibnizian program. The idea that the language of soul that has <laughs> primes that are, are linguistically independent, that are found in all languages, uh, and everything else is obtained by composition. Now, I find that totally uh, <laughs> unbelievable, but independently of my uh, views on the research project, uh, VSBK has argued she provided interesting evidence uh, that a concept like knowing uh, that you can see on this list of primes is found in, in all the languages that she's looked at. So that's actually, you know, I, I think it's fair to say there's a little bit of experimental philosophical evidence using vignette method and lexical semantics evidence um, uh, comparing the users of words across languages that at least for some epistemic concepts, uh, uh, languages might not matter a whole lot, at least, for, at least in some contexts. All right, so that's one aspect of the current debate. What I want to do next, and um, I think I'm, I'm doing reasonably well on, on, on time, I think I probably need 15 minutes about like that to go through the third, uh, the third section, is to um, provide you with a slightly, with an, another way of looking at the issue of variation. So mostly what I've done in the past and what experimental philosophers have done, they've looked at one specific use of a specific epistemic concept or lexem, and they've looked whether that use is invariant or varies across uh, languages and cultures. So you take, you, you gave the uh, GTA case, or you gave the uh, high and low stake back, uh, bank, bank cases, and you use well, that use varies across languages. Now that's interesting in some ways, but it's very limited in, in, in other ways. Um, it's very limited for methodological reason. You might be priming people to give an answer. The question may be quite unrelated with, with uh, everyday users of their concepts, of their epistemic concepts, uh, because after all, it's a very weird thing to do to read about a Getty case and to give an answer. Uh, um, and, um, and, and also it, it's, it, uh, its scope is quite limited because you're focusing on one concept in one use. Um, uh, so what we wanted to do is to think about another methodology to assess linguistic variation in epistemic concepts, just not one use of one concept. And uh, we were inspired by this paper in uh, Science by uh, Jackson and colleagues published in 2019. It's from uh, two labs, the lab of uh, Russell Gray and uh, Kristen uh, Linguist. Uh, Kristen Linguist works on emotion. Gray works on uh, reconstructing linguistic phylo phylogenies. Um, and uh, what they wanted to look was whether people across languages or across language families uh, draw the same distinction among emotion words. So partition the, what we could say, the emotion domain, the emotion linguistic domain, semantic domain in the same way. And they compared that to the color domain and to other domains. 
So we were inspired by, by their works, totally new methodology, which thought that was actually uh, really interesting. And we wanted to do the same thing for epistemic concepts. So instead of looking at uh, uh, words for emotion, we decided to do it for epistemic concepts, very broadly understood, because here you're not focusing on one concept, you're trying to map the epistemic domain uh, and see the differences and similarities. Now, let me tell you a bit about the methodology. So bear with me. Um, it's um, not always easy to present. So the so first concept to introduce the concept of collectification. So technique, a, a first language, French, for example, savoir et, and connaître. Right? It's two different words, two different lexemes are translated by a single word in English to know that. Right? Uh, that's collectification, right? The distinction that is drawn in French is collectified in English. All right, that's, that's just what collectification means. Collectification is a nice tool to think about linguistic variation. Why? Well, consider the following two situations. Uh, uh, in the situation on the top um, left of your um, screen, you have two languages and the partition between Lexem 1 and Lexem 2, connaître and savoir, is respected in the other languages. Um, um, uh, Vison and Kenan, right? Uh, great. There's no variation here between these two languages in the way the epistemic domain is partitioned. By contrast, in the situation we saw earlier, connaître and savoir are translated with a single word to know that there's greater variation in the second situation than in the first situation. So you can look at collectification across languages patterns of collectification in the epistemic domain to get a sense of how much variation there is across languages in the epistemic domain. If we're in the first type of situation, the one on the top left of your screen, there's very little variation. The distinction drawn in one language are respected in the other. If we are more in the second type of situation on the bottom right of your screen, there's more variation. The distinction drawn in one language are not respected in the other language. And of course, things can be much more complicated once you introduce languages, right? And remember, we've got 7,000 languages in the world. Uh, so they might actually partition things in extremely different manners, all right? That's the, that's the kind of collectification and why it's relevant to study linguistic variation. Now, in practice, a little bit more complicated because uh, to do that, the um, researcher introduced what they call concepts. Now, it's not clear what concepts are, and I, I'll, I'll come back to that in a, in, a, in a minute in this approach. So the view is that concepts are expressed by words. That's what the dotted uh, gray arrow means on your screen. The white arrow are again translation. So what you see in the first situation we looked at, uh, uh, um, uh, sorry, it should be Lexem 2 on the bottom. So uh, Lexem 1 in uh, the first language and Lexem 2 in the second, and Lexem 1 is the second language. So connaître and uh, Kenan uh, are um, 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 translated, translate the same concept. By contrast, um, uh, savoir and Wissen translate a second concept. Um, what you have on the bottom part, you also introduce two concepts. So, so Lexem 1 and Lexem 2 are, are expressing two distinct concepts, concept 1 and concept 2, which are expressed by the same Lexem in English to know that. And the heavy, the heavy line between the two concepts map actually the collectification. So the data I'm going to be presenting to you won't really present the words. They're going to be, to be describing how the concepts expressed by words happen to be collectified. Okay, now what are concepts on this view? Well, it's very, it's very unclear, to be honest, when you read, uh, when you look at uh, um, the type of, of work done by people working on collectification, by people working on, um, uh, uh, people who have been using uh, the, uh, database about collectification, it's really not quite clear what the tech concepts to be. My take on the matter, so it's really my, my understanding, I'm not reflecting the consensus in the field there, but my take on the matter is that we should view them just as um, in, as tools. They don't describe anything. They're just ways to, to help us map the distinctions a language draw into the distinctions another language draw. So we'll introduce two distinct concepts when a given language are make, is making a distinction. So we'll say, look, connaître and savoir are two distinct concepts because French distinguish connaître and savoir. So, you know, so we don't think there's anything more that is, is just in a sense, 
I, I, I suggest we take an instrumentalist perspective here about what, what I call concepts here. Now, it's a bit more complicated than that, I suspect. Uh, there's a little bit more to be said, I suspect, but that's uh, where I will stop for, for today. All right, so we've seen collectification. I've introduced a relation with collectification variation. I've introduced a notion of a concept in that context. The next thing I need to introduce is <coughs> the distinction between direct and indirect collectification. So direct collectification is uh, when there is uh, a, a, a pass of uh, um, collect. So when there is a direct, um, so let me give you an example. Uh, understand and knowing, to understand and to know, will be collectified in one language if there is a given, if in that language, so uh, to know is to know and to understand are expressed by the same word, right? Uh, and we're going to say they're directly collectified. However, that's not the measure we're going to be using. The measure we're going to be using following Jackson Coding is what they call indirect collectification. And uh, uh, here, the thought is that the database are extremely uh, imperfect. And uh, we're really trying to get uh, at um, the semantic similarities between concepts. So the idea is that um, uh, let's suppose that understand and know are collectified, understand and believe are uh, collectified in some other language in some other languages. Um, uh, the question is what's the relation between know and 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 believe? Well, we're going to say that they're indirectly collectified if there's a pass that goes from believe to know. Uh, by using direct collectification link. And the path here should be obtained by an algorithm that uses a random walk through all the possible collectification. Right? And you can use, uh, how, you can, you can use um, the probability of getting from one concept to the other one as a measure of the strength of collectification between these two concepts across languages. Uh, you can say, for example, even so believe and know aren't really collectified um, uh, uh, across languages. Um, 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 there's, a, there's an indirect path from one to the other. So there will be a weak connection between, between them. And we can represent that by a weak link between belief and and OK. So the data here that I'm going to be presenting are not really about direct collectification between concepts, they're about indirect collectification. And then when you do that, this is the kind of stuff you get. I, I, it's just to give you a, a, a sense of what you do when you obtain that. That's across all the languages in our corpus. I'll tell you about the corpus in a minute. But when you apply this methodology, you get a sense of which word are, uh, um, are likely to be um, collectified in your corpus, which words are unlikely to be collectified in your corpus. You can see, for example, that across all the languages, you know, aggregating across all the language families, know and understand that you can see in the middle of this graph here are extremely likely to be collectified. Meaning that in most language, in many, many languages, people do not distinguish to know that and to understand that from a lexical point of view. Of course, it does not mean they don't distinguish from a conceptual point of view. It's, it's, it's another step. We have no evidence. But at least from a lexical point of view, they don't draw the distinction. Um, uh, um, um, the same would be true if you look, for example, at um, surprisingly at teaching and learning. You know, that's something that's a distinction that we seem to be very important in English that we want to, to, to have to, to like them for them. Turns out that in, 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 in many languages, they're just not, not um, um, they are collectified. By contrast, if you look at uh, to know and uh, to feel, uh, what you can see is that while to know and to feel are collectified in some languages, the connection between them is much thinner, right, than to know and to understand. That, that's what this graph uh, tells you there. <coughs> Okay, so what we've done is uh, we wanted to measure variation. So for each language family, we didn't do it for each language, but we did it for um, 12, I believe, uh, language families. For each language family, we created a network of collectification using indirect collectification as a measure. All right, that's the first thing to do. Then we created cluster of uh, concepts using uh, some uh, clustering algorithms that create the best way of clustering uh, the concepts by looking at their similarity with one another. It's just a way of partitioning all the concepts into groups, right? So for example, in the language family, A, B, and C would form one cluster, G, F, and D would form another cluster, 
right? Um, and because uh, EB, ABC are closer to one another and they're more different than GFD and GFD are closer to one another. So there's more within similarities and across cluster differences. And it maximizes this kind of property within cluster similarity across cluster differences, all right? That's the second step of the, of the process. The third step of the process was to compare across families. All right, we've got, we did that for language family one, language family two. And we wanted to make a comparison of the similarity uh, between uh, these families. And to do that, we use something called the adjusted RAND index, which let me describe what it is. Uh, look at uh, B and C in language family one. It's part of the same cluster, this pair of, of, of concepts. It's also part of the same cluster in language family two. That in, that's, that's one pair that's part of the same cluster. The same is true for G, A, F. Two pairs are part of the same cluster. By contrast, A and C, which are part of the same cluster in language family one, are not part of the same cluster in language family two. A is its own cluster, uh, C and B are a distinct cluster. Um, so the adjusted rank index is going to be counting the pairs in one language, the, the pairs that are, the, uh, uh, the pairs that are, that in one language belong to a cluster and are also found in the same cluster in the other language family, right? It's a percent of, percentage of pairs that are together or apart in both family adjusted for chance, all right? So I hope the measure is, 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 is clear enough. We are counting the pairs that are part of one cluster, seen the other cluster, whether they are part of the same of also a given cluster or not. Pairs that are, are in two distinct clusters, we're looking at the next language family say, oh, are they part of two distinct clusters? And we count the percentage of pairs that has this property compared to all possible pairs. And we are just for chance, right? Okay, I hope the, the measure is intuitive enough. I think that's, that's reasonably clear. So we wanted to have benchmark because you know we're going to get a number, but it's hard to know what this number means. So we had two benchmark, emotions on the one hand, colors on, on the other. Our corpus is a corpus called clicks. It's been developed in uh, Germany by the Mac, I think by the Max Planck Institute, but I'm not sure. Um, so um, uh, don't quote me on this one. Um, and um, uh, we identify 78 epistemic concepts uh, or, or the copies covered near more than 2000 languages and 200 language families. How do we, do we create our, a list of epistemic concepts? We started by the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. So there's a linguistic bias here that we must, that we must totally acknowledge. So we, you know, we, we looked at all the, the articles and we identify uh, all the possible epistemic concepts there. Then we, lose, we, we looked at the database, what they call the Concepticon, the Concepticon in clicks, which is a list of all possible concepts that are, that are for which we have collectification data uh, in clicks. And so we use our first list of concepts. We narrowed it down using what was available in uh, the concepticons of Kilix. And then we use that to uh, analyze the collectification patterns in Kilix. So that's our final list here of the concept we happen to be uh, using. It's a very diverse list. Uh, you know, it, it has the obvious candidate knowing um, uh, uh, this um, um, recognizing, seeing, uh, but it has some that are a little bit less obvious, and I think that uh, we might redo it uh, with removing some of this concept. But that it was our uh, so first pass what we wanted to be uh, to be to be doing. We we we, sh we chose to be rather broad than uh, than narrow. All right. And here are the results of this methodology. Don't worry too much. You can't read. You can't read this. These are the um, 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 actually it's um, twenty-one uh, language families for which we created collectification uh, network. Again, uh, what the, the dot you see are all the concepts, uh, sixty plus concepts. The connections represent the strength of indirect collectification, as I've explained earlier. Now, um, what I really wanted to show you is this graph here. That's the adjusted rent index on the y axis. And that's a comparison between color, em, uh, emotion, nature, and the uh, epistemic concepts. Um, so uh, remember, the rent index uh, tells you uh, uh, the proportion of pairs in one language that are matched and found and are also matched in the other language, or the proportion of pairs that are mismatched and also mismatched in the other language. So when you've got one, 
it means that whatever uh, is matched in one language is also matched in the other language. Whatever is mismatched in one language is also mismatched in one language. When you have zero, it means the clustering is just orthogonal to one another, right? You can find something matched in one language, it's mismatched in the other and vice versa. Um, if you look at color, you see it's really all, and uh, what you have here is a distribution of all possible comparison between language families, right? So uh, each point, is you take two language families and you get a rand, a rand uh, adjusted rand index for this pair, right? So for if you look at color, for example, you've got language families that are pretty much perfectly matched. So distinction, the collectification drawn in one language are totally respected in the other language, but you've got some that are zero, right? Um, and that's the, uh, the mean is 0.22 here. Where do emotions stand? Uh, so where do epistemic concepts stand? Well, epistemic concepts stand uh, are, are less diverse than color concepts. Uh, so there's, there's less variation in the epistemic domain and the domain of color. Now, if you know a bit of literature on, on, on color term, it should not surprise you because there's actually quite a, there's a lot of variation in the way the color domain gets to be, uh, gets to be uh, partitioned. Um, uh, so there's a tremendous variation across languages. But there's more variation than uh, both for emotion there's actually substantially more variation than in the domain of emotions, which in some ways is quite surprising, um, uh, and uh, more variation than in the domain, than the domain of the description of nature uh, as, as well. So the answer is that there's actually quite a bit of variation, and, and what you don't see also is this uh, point on top of the y-axis where you find language families that pretty much agree on the way they're carving the epistemic domain. It's just not there. It's really bunched toward a low degree of um, 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 uh, matching, one might say, between between language families. Now, this uh, variation that we've observed across language families is partly predicted by uh, di by geographical distance, as one would be expected. It's actually, in a way, a sanity check. It's a it's a good thing that it's predicted by uh, geographical distance. It means the further apart the language families are. The more diverse it is, uh, 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 the more diverse a partition of the epistemic domain uh, is. It's totally meaningful, it's totally expected. It also reflects the fact that the more uh, geographically apart language families are, the longer it is that they've split from a historical point of view. Right? We are talking here, for example, about uh, people in Papua New Guinea and people in the uh, Amazonian basin. Uh, who have speak literally dozens of thousands of years ago. So the language have evolved in uh, very different ways across time. And the, the, the further apart they've split, the more different their partitioning of the epistemic domain. All right. Uh, what's the upshot? I think the epistemic field varies to a substantial degree, uh, more, more so than emotions, less than colors. And, I, and again, I, I, as, I, as I was very clear at the beginning, I can't prove that, and I can't even have a good argument really, uh, that it's, it's, it's bound to influence the way people think about uh, languages. But I think it gives us very serious reason to believe that um, uh, the type of partitions that we find obvious might be quite dependent on which language we happen to be talking. And here I want to go back to uh, what we started with, cofans. So the reason I, I, I picked out cofans and the reason I mentioned Amazonian languages is that Kofan is one of these Amazonian languages uh, that uh, you can see uh, here uh, uh, in the Amazonian basin. It's part of, uh, it's you know, the same part where you find language like the Shiwiya or the Shua, which I've been working on with the Geog Geography of Philosophy project. Um, an interesting fact about Kofan is that it's one of the languages in the world, one of the few languages in the world where to believe or to think which are often not distinguished. It's, it's very often not distinguished. Believe and to think often is the same word, pretty much like most languages in the world. But to believe and to think and to know are not lexically distinguished. So that, that's part of the world where a distinction that for us is basic, you know, uh, not only as epistemologists, but also just as lay speakers, um, that's a distinction that is just not lexicalized at all in this uh, language. Now, again, one, that does not mean that they are not sensitive to the conceptual distinction, but surely it also means that they might not be sensitive to this conceptual distinction. And that in practice, they might not be doing the kind of things that we do when we, for example, distinguish 
to think and to know, you know, everyday conversation, and as a result, you know, philosophical theorizing about the epistemic domain. Okay, uh, to conclude, uh, I think there's evidence of substantial variation when one goes beyond very specific users of specific concepts um, in, for example, the Getty case. Of course, that does not show that language influences epistemology. Uh, and as I said earlier, I don't quite know how I would uh, uh, nail that, 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 that claim. Uh, but I think it's at least suggestive. And I think it's not hard to imagine that uh, if I were a speaker of Kofan, and if I had, you know, in my practice, I would never distinguish a situation where one knows something from where one thinks something, I would find the distinction extremely baroque, extremely, extremely, extremely strange. And I would not have the type of epistemology I have uh, in uh, Western and English speaking epistemology. All right, I'd like to thank my co-author, Louis Chartrand, who was uh, the lead author on this project. He's the one who's done all the computer science work. So, you know, uh, I, 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 don't, I don't do this random work algorithm and all this sophisticated clustering stuff. Kelly Bauer has been my postdoc here uh, for uh, uh, two years. Daniel Wickenfeld, a former postdoc, who is now a, uh, an assistant professor at Pitt. Filippo Windrola, who is doing his, post, uh, his uh, PhD at Bochum, who completed it recently, and my colleague, uh, Colin Allen here, who does also a lot of philosophy of AI and computer science. All right, and thanks to John Templeton Foundation for this uh, funding for this uh, project. Thank you very much.